ne vai così. Ah, allora. Il più bello era di avere anche Gianluca con noi. E comunque... Allora... Bene, abbiamo... Uh, no, sorry. Uh, so we have tonight a screening of um, Archie Fochomkin on the Piazza Grande and uh, Naum Kleeman with uh, uh, Edmund Meisel's score, which is well-known but seldom performed in such good conditions. And Naum Kleeman can tell us if there is anything new. Uh, Battleship Potemkin is probably one of the most talked about, written about films of film history. And uh, it's been written about filmically, politically, uh, scientifically, philologically, uh, even uh, in, fictionally, in literature, etc., etc. It has a huge amount of knowledge attached, attached to it. Uh, it has a story of censorship, it has a story of screenings, it has a story of reconstructions. Um, so it never stops. Every 10 years we have news about Battleship Potemkin, and uh, I wonder what can we find out tonight in this screening, and what should we talk about, or what should we think about when we talk about Potemkin today. Okay. Yeah, this is a very strange film. I must tell you, uh, there are thousands of books mentioning Potemkin, and sometimes you are thinking it's enough. It's like, like Mona Lisa, you know, you cannot see it anymore. <laughs> and uh, this is a, became a kind of kitsch if you have too much about a masterpiece, what is a masterpiece? Of course, nobody neglected it, but at the same time, you have the feeling this is a simple film and you don't need more explanations. Everything is clear, there are some details maybe, but, but in the same time, each decade, we have another Potemkin. And maybe this is the same uh, phenomenon like Hamlet, by Shakespeare, because to be or not to be is also a kind of Mona Lisa. Yeah, everybody knows it's perfectly, it's enough, 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 but each generation has his own Hamlet, and I think Potemkin has the same uh, quality. Even Eisenstein himself wrote once that uh, Potemkin was born like Venus, from, uh, the, uh, from the sea, he didn't expect such a great success. And he hates sometimes Potemkin because everybody asks to have another Potemkin. October was criticized because it was different from Potemkin. They were waiting second Potemkin about October Revolution. The uh, Potemkin was about Revolution uh, 905. And actually the government was sure that Eisenstein will repeat Potemkin in 1916, but it was different. The revolution were different. Eisenstein was different, and he made, of course, different a different film. Uh, and Potemkin, uh, for Eisenstein, was he wrote once not the end, the beginning of a new Renaissance, a new movement, new avant-garde, but it's the end of avant-garde. Yeah. There is a very interesting. Yeah. yeah, this is the end of avant-garde. This is a final stage of experiments of the early 20s and after Potemkin. You should start a new page of the film history. And everybody was waiting for following of Potemkin. But this was written by Eisenstein in 1928 that uh, Potemkin is actually the end of avant-garde, the climax, but the end. But in 1945, he wrote a wonderful letter to uh, Potemkin. It's strange when a director wrote a letter to his own creation, asking him 
to forgive for his early conceptions. And Potemkin opened a new page of the history, not only finished the experiments age, but after the explosion of atomic bomb on Hiroshima, he wrote that Potemkin actually became a new quality, a new, it became a, a, again actual, because the tragedy of Hiroshima, as well as also uh, the tragedy of Guernica, is the same that was in Odessa, on Odessa steps in his Potemkin. This is a tragedy of cruelty of powers that ignores the lives of other people for their own needs and they're suppressing. And Potemkin not only condemned the power, the unhuman power, it also was a film, utopian maybe film, about brotherhood of people on the world, doesn't matter what is the race of beliefs or religion. And this is exactly what I am thinking now about Potemkin, that there is a great triad of French Revolution, it's liberté, égalité, fraternité. And everybody speaks about Frei, uh, the, uh, Freiheit in Deutschland, uh, of German freedom uh, for uh, English, and also égalité, yeah, so social uh, rights for everybody, yeah. But what is about brotherhood? We have forgotten this word. It's not occasionally because only egalité, only liberté, it's not enough. And I must, I must tell you that I opened a short time ago, maybe a year ago only, I was thinking what is a strange title in the, the moment when uh, the uh, killed sailor Vakulinchuk is on uh, the morning, uh, morning, yeah, about uh, morning, yeah. morning uh, about Vakulinchuk, and one lady, young lady, she is Jewish. You can see it, and uh, the, and she belongs to the Russian party um, Bund. Bund was a socialist Jewish party, and she asked mother, mothers, and brothers. Uh, I will try to be correct. Sorry. I will try to quote correctly this title. She uh, says, we, uh, yes, mothers and brothers, let there be no difference and enmity between us. And I was thinking for the first time after so many years, of studying Potemkin, why actually not mothers and fathers, fathers, not brothers and sisters, what is natural, yeah, to have brothers and sisters, but mothers and brothers, what is actually the meaning? Oh, is this occasionally? And I remember that in a hospital, there is a, two evangelists are telling about mother of Jesus, Maria, and his brothers came to see Jesus, and he was with his pupil, and one of them taught him, Rabbi, your mother and your brothers are here. And Christus answered, who is my mother and who is my brother? And some People are thinking that maybe it's a very strange attitude to his family from, yeah, from the side of Jesus. But the meaning of this episode is that you who are with me are my family. Not before, because he didn't love his mother or his brothers, but there is some 
relationship may be much more important than the connection of the blood of the family. Another family is important. You see, this is a quotation, I'm sure is not occasional. Of course, Eisenstein knew what he did. Because after that, after this replica of this uh, woman, one of the uh, provocators is crying down with the Jews and they started to beat him. And this is a provocation, of course, because uh, Jewish pogroms were a part of the revolution of 1905. And Eisenstein summer, uh, is summering here the old, uh, old um, conflicts of Russian society turning back to gospel. It's not only one quotation from gospel. Strange, the film about revolution and revolution, as you know, more atheistic. But Eisenstein, who, by the way, was baptized in his childhood in the name of Sergei Shafradonesh, who is a Russian saint like Francisco von Assisi. Uh, actually, he knew and he remembered very well this moment. This is a very interesting combination of these Christian beliefs about the unity of the much more important maybe than the family uh, connections. And th even the word brother, what is a kind of, from the very beginning, the first, first title has this word brother, until the very end, you have repetition of this word brother, 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 brother. And then I remember that Eisenstein actually wanted to make two parts of Potemkin. To, uh, uh, actually, not two parts. It was a, a bigger film, film about 1905, the film. And Potemkin is only part of this bigger plan to have a film about the revolution. And in a bigger script, you have many motifs connected to the right. Bible and gospel. So we have to study again, especially this early script where from Potemkin is coming. You know, Potemkin started as a big film and then they didn't have time enough uh, until the jubileum, so they cut it, everything, and only one episode. But Eisenstein summarized here the whole revolution. But so many motives are coming in the bigger script that we have to think about. What actually was beyond the, uh, this plot about Potemkin. And then exactly the same repeated Eisenstein with October, because October we have now is only the first part of the revolution. What is quasi uh, a puppet, uh, um, what is a, um, a kind of marionette uh, theater. All parties here are actually toys, and they pretend to be uh, creators of the history, but they are marionettes. So the first part we know now, October, is actually a very satirical view on the first year of revolution, 1917, between February and October. But the second part, written by Eisenstein, you can read it in Russian, it was published many years ago, I am not sure it was translated into other. This is a civil war and this is a tra tragedy. The other part of this comedy of the first year of revolution is the tragedy of civil war. And actually Eisenstein made here not only exodus from slavery, but also a warning of a new catastrophe what can come from this um, shooting to, uh, to brothers. It's actually, he repeats the motifs of Cain and Adam. You see, this is again civil war as the first sin of humanity. One brother's brother kills another brother. So this word brother, it's not occasionally used in Potemkin. 
Of course, it's brotherhood of Christian brotherhood. Of course, it's evolutionary brotherhood. It's also brotherhood of Cain and Abel from uh, Old Testament Bible. So you see, Potemkin has some dimensions. We didn't check very careful in the beginning. And we have rethink about this film. Also, the montage. Everybody speaks about montage of Potemkin, and of course, montage is very powerful here. But to understand how com complex is this new language of Eisenstein, you must understand that Eisenstein not only uses uh, close-ups, not only this dynamic um, rhythm, and not only the change of subjects, each moment that you have the different points of view, but this is also a kind of hieroglyphs. He wrote that montage uses the language closer to Japanese hieroglyphs, Chinese hieroglyphs, than to the European languages. And I would like uh, to show you one episode, one short, very, very, very short episode of uh, his, maybe we can show in movement, yeah. Please, the moment when Vakulinchuk stops the execution. Mm -hmm. So, should the This is the world brother. So this moment one of the climaxes of this film, there is a very interesting break in the movement when everything stops, the movement stops. You can see here uh, what is... Yeah. Yeah, can, you, can you help me? Yeah, it's better to show... Yeah. We have the, the stills, yeah, if you, if possible, not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look what Eisenstein did. Actually, he could make a break. You know, this tension is known that if you have this uh, crescendo, you can stop the movement, and this brings a new tension in the audience. And Eisenstein could um, use any details of the battleship. What he is using? What he is making? This is... Uh, no, back. 
you have here the cross in the hands of the Pope, then you have this cries, and then the eagle, this is a symbol of Tsarist power, and then you have the trumpet, and then the gesture of, the, uh, of one of the sailors asking for, uh, what is, uh, to, to, to uh, help them, yeah? And Vakulinchuk uh, cries after this, uh, those um, images. What it is about, actually, the cross has a very important symbol, the Christ who is Savior. And also the ring is also to save. And also the Tsarist eagle, it's also Tsar officially was the father of his people. Who can help? And actually Eisenstein gives all variants, and this is also uh, Sailor's Brotherhood, this trumpet, what brings them together, discipline, so-called. So, this is a kind of variance, who can help? There was international, the official hymn of Russia, of Soviet Russia at that time, nobody will help you, neither Tsar or God or hero, only you, by your own hands, you will conquer the liberty. That is uh, actually, I don't know the uh, exact words of international in English, but nevertheless, no God, no Tsar, yeah? yes. not hero. You yourself can help you. And Vakulunchuk uh, cries because he, is, he became responsibility. He is responsible for the lives of his brothers. You see, this is a very interesting, very important moment that actually what was written in Eisenstein's uh, notes for this episode, there, he filmed even uh, the flag who is absolutely helpless, the flag of the sailors, then dolphins, dolphins, yeah, yeah, who are coming from the sea, and you know this... Um, and antique motifs because delphins were helping people on the sea. They are a symbol of help. And he cut it out. We have clippings of those uh, 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 stills. And Einstein didn't use no flag or, or delphins. Only what is connected to the main symbols connected also to the hymn of international. So it means it's very interesting how he uh, is used the details, the realistic details. It's not symbols only, but they have a symbolical level. You know, Dante wrote once in his uh, small writings about four levels of interpretation of each piece of art must have four levels of interpretation. The first level is realistic, everyday life you can see around you. The second level is allegorical level. The third level is moral level. And the fourth level is anagogical. It means it's God's level, heaven's level. So realistic, symbolical or uh, allegorical, then uh, moral, and then um, God's or uh, heaven's level. Here you can see all four levels together. It's realistic details from the same situation, from the same uh, ship also. So is everything absolutely realistic? You can understand it's only as a break in a uh, plot. It has also metaphorical thinking. Each, uh, each of these objects has this metaphorical or allegorical. It's this and something else. It has also a moral thinking, who can help, and the morality of religion of this Pope, of the Orthodox religion, who didn't uh, help the um, victims of Tsarist regime, but blessed the executions. This is also uh, the state, the eagle, 
double head eagle, yeah, is actually uh, the Byzantine symbol, the, author um, the autocracy. It has also moral level, who is responsible for lives of the people on the earth. And of course, it has also highest level. So you can see that Eisenstein was very careful using details, realistic details, and combining the film. This is only one uh, episode, but we have many like that to discover four levels of interpretation. Even the famous uh, machine sequence on the end when Potemkin goes uh, to the uh, Skada, what is Escada, Escada yeah. Uh, and they are waiting for a civil war, actually, for execution on the other level. And at that moment, the machine becomes a herd of Potemkin, of the sheep, but also of collective. You can see it's a herd. At that time, the po it was very popular, uh, the machinism, when people, you can remember, for example, um, Fernand Léger, who made actually people or landscapes like machines. Also Picasso was very good with that, with this ironical play, with this constructivist, metaphorical machine of life. And Eisenstein made just opposite. Actually, he brings human content into machine. Machine became the herd of people. This a whole sheep became a kind of a uh, human organism, etc., uh, etc. Et this is one of maybe interesting themes f to teach what actually montage was. Nobody will make cut like P Potemkin today. Today is a completely different s cinema language. But in the same time, nobody will make now cubistic pictures like Braque and Picasso. Of course, but nobody can exclude this painting from history of art. And all new uh, schools of painting, they must learn something from Cezanne, from Braque, from Picasso, from uh, other cubistic. Um, and of course, Potemkin was cut it in cubistic style. This is a cubistic style. You have here many um, perspectives, fragments. This is analytical cubist and also synthetical cubism, bringing together, so first of all, analyzing the reality and then bringing the, uh, it, a new reality together. And I would love to show you another example, what we discovered recently, n last year. It was in a map of Potemkin book. You know, they prepared for 20 years of Potemkin, 1944. Uh, Eisenstein and his wife, Pera Atashva, prepared a special collection of articles and pictures uh, dedicated to 20 years of Potemkin. But because Ivan the Terrible was forbidden, the book was ready. It was in a, a, a publishing house and it was destroyed immediately after uh, the second part of Ivan was forbidden by Stalin. And this collection of texts and pictures was waiting for our eyes. But you know, sometimes you can see and not see. You know that there is a sometime, so, something and you don't understand what it is, a kind of illustration. And I would love to show you now another uh, this is about mise-en-scène and mise-en-cadre of Baranosic Potemkin. Mise-en-cadre was a word created by Eisenstein as analog to mise-en-scène. Mise-en-scène, we know from French, is the position of actors on the stage and the evolution of our movements on the stage, on horizontal. But it became later also a kind of metaphorical director, is the author of mise-en-scène. Mise-en-scène means also direction, yeah? In French. Yeah. yeah. Director or 
l'art de la mise en scène. Eisenstein wrote also a book, Regisura, or l'art de la mise en scène. But mise en cadre, he used also this word mise en cadre, and we were thinking that mise en cadre means something what is in vertical, yeah? Is a, in a still, in a frame, because mise en scène is horizontal, mise en cadre is vertical on the screen and the evolution. And what is composition of the still, of the frame? The same mise en cadre. Composition is mise en cadre or vice versa, yeah? Mise en cadre is composition of elements on the screen. And one day we saw the schemes in this collection of illustrations for Potemkin uh, 1944, and we understood. Actually, Eisenstein explains us what is mise en cadre. May I cannot. No, no, please. This, uh, yeah, can you please show us another, no, different, it's, yeah, here, thank you, yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, this is mise-en-scene. You can see here all shots filmed from above, and you can see the changing of evolution of the uh, sailors and officers from the beginning until the end and revolt. This is the evolution of mise-en-scene. Please show us uh, next. Here. Here, you have. Here. This is a real, this was a real mise-en-scene of reality, not when Potemkin, but Eisenstein repeated what was done in a real ship, battleship Potemkin, uh, how uh, the, um, Sailors were waiting for the execution, and other sailors were here on the uh, cannons. But then the evolution of the movement, Eisenstein made very careful. Some of his assistants made the schemes after his uh, draft scheme. And this is, everything is mise-en-scene, the evolution from the beginning until the end. But then comes this scheme. You see, you have a booth, a photo made by a photographer, not the cameraman Tisse, but a photographer, um, Pfeffer, Vladimir Pfeffer, who made advertising photos. And you can see how they are staying, the soldiers here, the, uh, on the executors of Potemkin steps. You can see uh, the faces, you can see also uh, they are not linear, but Eisenstein made completely different mise en cadre. Yeah, you see only in profile, only one line. They are machine-like. This was, was the first, and he made very strange squares here. What it means? Look, this is explanation from this total. He has he is making smaller cl uh, close-ups, yeah? It's possible from this total shot make m different variations. From this one, for example, you see these are no numbers in the cutting system and you can see how he makes variations using different uh, objectives, different point of views, and combining them you never see the faces. This is a machine of execution. They are not human. And he makes variations of this quality of unhuman power. Again, you can see only cannons, only the uh, feats, and this is fragments, faceless. And he combines this motif of faceless power, shooting, killing, coming down. Or he makes variations from the back and a line absolutely faceless and then again 
only canons. You see, this is one motifs in many variations, and those variations gave, gave him the possibility to make this montage. Actually, mise en cadre, he makes out in French also mise en cadre, mise en cadre, and the end. It means many mise en cadre. Variations of this mise en cadre who gives you possibility to make montage develop one motifs. And this is actually Eisenstein's discovery here in Potemkin that mise en cadre is a step between mise en scène and montage. Without mise en cadre would be impossible to have the, this freedom of variations. And it's like music, exactly a musical uh, side of uh, uh, the evolution one theme. Or here, you have another moment, the child, uh, the mother was uh, the killed child, uh, Odessa Madonna, this is another reminiscence from gospel. This lady was a killed uh, child. And Eisenstein makes the different mise en cadre, what gives him the, this pieta, the variations of pieta, killing a killed a boy and mother with her cry. But here, just opposite, you, have, you can see only faces. And faces, this, uh, just opposite to this power, faceless power, faceless regime. And again, this is the combination of two themes, the face of uh, tragedy and the faceless power of suppression. Eisenstein combines them here with different mise en cadre. Here you can see how it was filmed, and Eisenstein made even here movement of camera. It was very rare in the early film when his camera was static, but here he makes even a moving camera following the mother with a child running on the stage. Yeah, thank you. Or look, here you have the first photo made by Pfeffer. You can see steps, you can see this chaotic um, group of this um, teacher with her uh, citizens. And the um, shot by Tisse. Tisse exclude all motives not connected to the theme of hope to ask power to be human. She is asking them, soldiers, don't shoot to your brothers, to your child, children. And look what Eisenstein and Tisse are making. They make exactly the composition, but it's not only a composition. It's a kind of unity of a small group protesting against the, um, uh, the violence. And everything what is not connected to the theme is excluded from the, um, from the shot. And here you have the mise en cadre, how he developed from one total shot, how many variations he's bringing uh, on the screen and the evolution from uh, the angst fear. Fear. From the fear in the beginning to the protesting in the end. This evolution he developed in close-ups and mm, uh, this very interesting rep repetition of the same motifs, but differently shot it. And again, this is something else. This is mise en cadre in another sense, the position of camera. The square here in the middle is Odessa steps, and you can see five positions of camera outside the steps and five positions inside the step. And bringing camera from all sides, like cubistic, different, uh, uh, different perspectives like Delaunay made in painting, he combined them in one action. Actually, 
the, here you can see also photos we found all photos by Pfeffer from different points of this mise-en-cadre, mise-en-scène de caméra. Caméra was also has his own, its own mise-en-scène. So it means we have to analyze actually this Eisenstein technology technique of shooting, not only montage, because till now we were thinking about montage as a system of cutting uh, stills. Now we have to think about shooting, what is, I think, also not enough uh, learned. Sorry, it's too long my no, speech. Okay. It's interesting. You have, well, there are, there are two things that you've said. Well, two motives in what you said. The first was, of course, the change of point of view that one might have, that what one might have, that Eisenstein may have had in 28, 25, 28, right after the film, considering the film was the end of a cycle for him, the end of an experience for him. And then the flashback of 45, of Eisenstein giving, or you interpreting it, as a humanistic cry for peace or for, for nonviolence, which maybe was not, the, or, was not the original dominating intention. So you had this thing. And I think adding your own point of view, adding our own point of view, which of course has changed a lot in the, over, over the years, ever since I've heard you speak about Potyomkin, your point of view has evolved in this way, uh, which is now returning, in my opinion, to an idea of montage, which you haven't said, which you haven't discussed, but which is, of course, also mentioned is uh, in Eisenstein, which is the montage as film montage as a specific instance of the general principle of montage. Mm -hmm. And I think in what you said about the references to the gospel or the influence of the gospel or uh, this new point that you have on religion as a childhood experience or as a, um, as a decisive experience in Eisenstein's life probably is also part of his... Of, his principle of montage, Eisenstein using to make a film everything that was part of his most intimate experience, whether it's childhood, upbringing, culture, religion, rituals. Actually, religion with Eisenstein has mostly been discussed from the point of view of rituals, mm -hmm. but uh, you're discussing it from the point of view of a return to the basics of the gospel, not the religious, not the specifically religious aspect of the gospel, but the ground, the basic point of the gospel, and so which brings us quite far from what we've seen in the films before. So I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the fact that a lot of people have tried to find religion in Eisenstein, but you're approaching it in quite a different way today. Yeah, it's a good question because, you see, Eisenstein was very religious in his youth, but he, it was a crisis. We don't know what happens in 1916 when he was against the church. He was not anti-religious. Anti it was something uh, okay. what brought him against the church. But I don't know what happened. Nobody knows. He wrote by himself and his memories that he was for the f last time by, what is the, uh, Beichte, not Beichte. Uh, yeah, Beichte. Beichte, the uh, hotel. Yeah. No, no, no. Pray. pray not pray, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is my Lord? But they are coming uh, to, to, to. Yeah, Beichte, yeah? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Sorry? Confession. Confession, yeah. So, thank you. The confession for the f last time, it was in 1916 in Petersburg, and something happened. We don't know what exactly. And, of course, Eisenstein didn't speak about that until his last years. Only in his memory, memoirs, there are some motives that show that it was not 
anti-religious. He was sometimes very skeptical about Christian religion. He also summarized different beliefs. He studied also Eastern culture. Uh, Lao Tzu became very important for him in the last years. Even Zen Buddhism at the time in 1946, what was unusual, Zen Buddhism came much later to Europe. But for Eisenstein, it was a discovering. But in the same time, he was very serious with this moral side of religion, and especially of Christian religion. Secondly, you see, Eisenstein was using sometimes the language of the time, and I'm not sure. What I'm telling now is a kind of probably, probably, he covered his real ideas in his films with the words the authorities want to hear. You know, it was a very strange, very strange uh, covering language. It's kind of, um, it's not double face Eisenstein. Some people are telling that Eisenstein has had double faces. He was not uh, honest enough. He, he was also cruel. He was unhuman. I know some of my friends are t uh, accusing him to be unhuman, to be sadistic even. And he wrote by himself that actually he have had this very strange moments of sadistic uh, feelings, unfortunately, and he was afraid by himself. But in the same time, he was very honest in his creations. But from his childhood, his father learned him to tell the words he wants to hear. For example, he was inviting small boy Eisenstein to his guests, asking his boy, Serioja, tell me, are you satisfied with my buildings? Are they not geniuses? And he answered, yes, father, you are a genius in the architecture. <laughs> Terrible. But this was a language covering Eisenstein's real feelings because he made drawings, actually parodies on father's uh, draw, uh, buildings. He parodized buildings in his drawings. So his creation was much more sincere than his speeches in childhood. And also in his uh, articles of 20s and 30s, you can find something what is covering the real meaning of his creations. You want to listen to those words better? Please, you can... Uh, have it. Wasn't but, that something, wasn't that a common feature to many Soviet artists? Yes, yeah. Unfortunately, to many it was, artists. Yeah, to many to artists. many artists in uh, times of autocracy. Yeah, it was not only for Einstein. That's, I, 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 uh, yeah, he, I'm he sure. He did it in his... He did it. In, an, in his own way. To, 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 to have the possibility to make what he wants, but I am sure he was absolutely sincere in his creation, not in his article. So we must separate... Yeah what is written and published at that time in articles and newspapers. There are different languages in newspapers and in his writings, in theoretical writings. And we must be very careful to understand what Eisenstein is doing until the very last years. And in the very last years, in 1946, 47, and the first months of 48 when he died, he became much more open and sincere in unpublished writings. I am sure at that time nothing was published. You must remember that no one book was published in Russian in Eisenstein's life. Only in America it was published the film Sense, the collection of his writings, and the script of Ivan the Terrible. That's all. All his books were not con collected in books. The, some articles were published in newspapers or in news um, in the magazines, but no, no one book appeared in, during his life. And I think that Eisenstein in the last years understood he will, no, will never see a book published, and he is much more open in the notes of his books like Non-Indifferent Nature, Method, 
Pushkin and Gogol, unpublished till now, and memoirs. So, and another side also, what is also important to understand with Eisenstein's case. I think Eisenstein created sometimes intuitively, everybody knows that Eisenstein was very smart, very educated, he was very rational, everybody will tell you this, this is a rationalist, yeah, he's, he knew everything what he's, uh, he was done, it's just opposite. I think Eisenstein was sometimes, like Mozart, he created intuitively, and then he started to making researches. And this is like a ping pong. It's not as if his theories is explanation of his work and his works are illustrations to his theories. They are, it's like ch uh, chess, you know? They are white and uh, black um, squares. His theories and his uh, films are connected not not directly, it's not the wrong word, but it's not illustrations to his theories or just opposite. They are essays thinking about art with some examples from his own creations and many sides of his creations were never analyzed by himself. You can find a lot of things he never mentioned in his writings, but they exist. And just opposite, there are wonderful ideas never filmed by Eisenstein. And you have to be very careful with his writings because, for example, not only his projects like Glass House or Capital and others are still very interesting and important as a provocation for a new language of cinema, but also some ideas of, for example, in his method there are some ideas about ritual or about... Mm, uh, ornament, etc., and you didn't f cannot find it, for example, in his own films, but you can find in McLaren's, for example. You can analyze Norman McLaren, the great master of uh, Canadian animation, with motives of Eisenstein's theory. Etc. Sorry. Etc. As you say, well, I remember to return to Potemkin one yeah. last time. I remain fascinated with a lot of things that you've said at the beginning, and then, of course, mm -hmm. one has to wander and to go off and to sail. But uh, I was fascinated last time I saw Potemkin. Every time is different, of course, but by the speed, by the use, by the, by the lightweight aspect of the film. It's not at all the thundering blow that um, has made its reputation, the great classic of revolutionary film. But on the contrary, it's a film by a young man. It's a very, it, it's a very swift movement in the film. The creation of the film is very quick. And I think you explained that with the idea that the film was some, something coming out of a larger project. And probably the, the idea of um, using everything or not using everything, but having everything at disposal mm -hmm. to make this film was, uh, in a way, uh, another illustration of a principle of montage. You choose, but you have everything at your disposal. Your culture, your, uh, the history, the official history of the Communist Party, you have your uh, co-screenwriter, or you have your political advisors doing this, but at the same time, something is bound to be spontaneous and to mm -hmm. be born from this in one gesture. And probably that's why this film has this extraordinary, fascinating quality, mm -hmm. because it's so one great movement, one hour and 10 minutes, one movement, and not a linear movement and like in classical cinema or Western cinema, but one great movement of of a surge, of an upsurge, it's really a the idea of revolution from bottom to up, upwards. Yes, so, I think it's really a film so, of the post-revolutionary situation of new economical okay. policy. policy. Uh, we, have yes, to, we have to cut, yeah. Okay, that's the very last. 15 minutes, so just 15 minutes, we have still five minutes. <laughs> one, one minute, one minute. And then we'll see. <laughs> yeah. This, the, the film expresses the feelings of the revolution after the 
war communism. It was terrible years of civil war and war communism from 1918 till 1923. And 1923 started a new policy, peaceful, much more uh, human, and I think Potemkin is expression not of the revolutionary year, but after post-war revolution. Yeah. Sorry. Great. No. Long. Thank you. No, thank you for this quick answer after this long <laughs> talk. And thank, well, thank you very much. I, I hear that we are late, but actually we are, we are not late. They were late before us, but still we we'll have to cut short. And. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the examples, and thank you very much for the various hypotheses, point of view, diverging stories. And so, thank you, and thank you for listening. <laughs>